Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining the LGBT Community Center of Greater Cleveland University Hospitals and the Clinical and Translational Science Collaborative of Cleveland for coffee and conversation virtual speaker series. So who is missing from clinical research? You, me, and us is the title of our conversation today. Before we introduce our special guest speaker, please note that we encourage questions throughout the program, but we'll address them in a more formal Q&A portion towards the end of, of our conversation today. So without further ado, I am so pleased and honored to welcome and introduce to you an outstanding leader, researcher, and health disparities trailblazer, Dr. Monica Webb Hooper. Dr. Webb Hooper is the Deputy Director of the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities at the NIH. She works closely with, the, with Director Dr. Perez Stable and the leadership to oversee all aspects of the Institute and to support the implementation of the science visioning recommendations to improve minority health, reduce health disparities, and promote health equity. Dr. Webb Hooper is an internationally recognized translational behavioral scientist and clinical health psychologist. She has dedicated her career to the scientific study of minority health and racial and ethnic disparities focusing on chronic illness prevention and health behavior change. Her program of community engaged research focuses on understanding multi-level factors and biopsychosocial mechanisms underlying modifiable risk factors such as tobacco use and stress processes, and the development of community responsive and culturally specific interventions. Her goal is to contribute to the body of scientific knowledge and disseminate findings into communities with high need. Before joining the NIH, Dr. Webb Hooper was a professor of oncology, family medicine, and community health as well and psychological sciences at Case Western Reserve University. She was also the Associate Director for Cancer Disparities Research and the Director of the Office of Cancer Disparities Research in the Case Comprehensive Cancer Center. Welcome, Dr. Webb Hooper. I'd like to Thank introduce- you. Thank you. Um, I would like to introduce next Jalise Thomas. Jalise is an attorney by trade whose interest and passion for law policy, community, and economic development guide her approaches to diversity, equity, and inclusion work. She is the Assistant Director of Strategic DEI and Health Disparities at Case Western Reserve University for the Clinical and Translational Science Collaborative. Before joining Case Western, she worked at University Hospital's Clinical Research Center, leading clinical research, diversity, equity, and inclusion, along with community outreach. Jalise serves as an inaugural virtual community ambassador for the Association of American Medical Colleges Collaborative for Health Equity, ACT Research Generate Evidence, and is a member of Cleveland Leadership Center's Cleveland Bridge Builders Class of 2022. And finally, I, it is my pleasure to welcome our board member, Braveheart Gilani, who is also a current PhD student at the Mendel School of Social Work at Case Western Reserve University. He earned his master's in social work. Braveheart's research and advocacy are focused on sexual and gender minorities, healthy masculinity development, along with issues of racial equity and social justice. He is currently involved in several research projects promoting LGBTQIA health and navigating through larger social systems. Thank you all for being willing to share your time and expertise to bring this important conversation to our community. And without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Jalise to get us started. Thank you, Golnar. Dr. Webb Hooper, thank you again for joining us this evening to talk about the importance of diversity in clinical research and how we can ensure that everyone has opportunities to participate if they choose to. To kick off the conversation, can you tell us about how you crafted a career in the scientific study of minority health and racial ethnic disparities? Well, thank, I wanna start by thanking you, um, Golnar, and to the Center for the Invitation to be a part of this really important conversation. So I wanna thank you um, just for the opportunity to share. And, and that question that you ask is one that we probably don't have time to fully delve into, but I will say that you know, as a clinical health psychologist and, and when I was training, my first 
research experience was working on a project focused on HIV um, and stress management. Um, and we work primarily with women living with HIV and, uh, and also men who have sex with men. And it was at that time that I really became enamored by the field of health psychology, of medical psychology, which really studies mind-body relationships. And also I was uh, very interested in addictions and health behavior change. And when I learned about the various disparities that existed and the undue burden faced by um, racial and ethnic minority communities, sexual and gender minority communities, that really is what inspired me to pursue this area of study um, for, a, for a career. And, and actually at that time learning that you know, this field of health disparities was relatively new, especially at that time. And so I saw it as a, uh, a need in the field to really apply scientific methods to address these issues. Thank you. And as a follow-up to that question and what you just shared, which chronic illnesses are plaguing our racially and ethnically underserved communities right now? Well, it's interesting that you say right now on the question, um, because that implies that we're thinking about what's happening in 2022. But you know, health disparities are not new. And I should also say, when we talk about health disparities, we are talking about not just any differences, but specific differences that are due to disadvantage, social disadvantage. And when we talk about health disparities, we do often talk about them in terms of race and ethnicity, but there are other groups who also experience health disparities, such as those who are sexual and gender minority populations, um, underserved rural communities, and, um, individ and that's irrespective of their socioeconomic status, underserved rural communities as well. And so, you know, we, when we think about this, this issue, most of the data we have are when we look at race and ethnicity, but health disparities have existed for centuries before they were studied or we had this term to study them. And, and I would say that health disparities represent a pandemic in their own right. We have had some progress in some areas, but we have a long way to go. So if you look at the current health disparities, we do have considerable differences in most conditions by race, ethnicity, and other identities. These disparities include shorter overall life expectancy in some groups, um, higher rates of chronic diseases such as cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes. Also, we have stark and embarrassing racial and ethnic disparities in infant mortality, maternal morbidity and mortality, stroke, cognitive impairment, asthma, sexually transmitted infections, dental diseases, and also differences in the prevalence and outcomes of mental illness, just to name, and that's not even the full list. And then of course, COVID-19. I guess a point uh, to jump in over here, Dr. Hooper, a point to make over here is this is all about structural oppression, right? So uh, structural racism, queerphobia, transphobia, homophobia, all those elements, we're, we're explicitly saying that this is not because of biological or genetic factors. This is because of social constructs and that debunks the existent myths of if there is anything lacking within the biology of uh, minority communities as compared to this is the oppression that we're experiencing. Thank you for that. I, um, I want to open this question up first to you, Braveheart, because it links really well with what you were just saying. Um, and then I would like everybody else to jump in. Um, I'm really interested to hear from you about what you have seen in your role, both as a community member, but also a researcher. What have you seen to be the biggest impediments to developing sustainable interventions around chronic illnesses and community healing? The biggest impediments that I see are around notions of connection, right? Like if, if the interventions aren't focused on the community and they aren't centered on the community's needs, if, if the interventions are coming from the side of the researcher and the researcher's lens rather than specifically responding to the needs of the community, they'll never really solve the problem. And within that, within systems, we have a lot of trauma and violence that minority communities end up experiencing. And if the interventions aren't really responding to the issues, then they won't really solve the problem. So we can you know, think about, for example, minority stress theory and how 
within the how the theory clear, clearly explains that it is it is the structural violence and uh, which impacts the communities more. It's not their genetic factors, right? Um, Dr. Webb Hooper, is there anything you'd like to add? Sure, I think uh, I underscore what Braveheart has shared about you know structural factors being at the root of why we have health disparities. And to take that back, you know, when I define health disparities, I define them as differences that are rooted in social disadvantage. So by definition, we are talking about social problems. I think one of the biggest impediments to advancement in this field, however, is that much of the research has focused on individual level biological mechanisms um, or individual level behavior as explanations for the poor health often observed among uh, minoritized groups and explanations for disparities. But if you have that singular focus on biology or genetics, or a singular focus on behavior, why don't people just change their behavior? Then you, you miss the great complexity of understanding and addressing health disparities because you're not looking at those other domains of influence, such as the physical or built environment, um, the sociocultural environment, the healthcare system. And you're not looking at the other levels of influence that are upstream to individual level factors. You have interpersonal factors, community factors, societal factors within those domains. And all of these factors at the interpersonal community societal level, also you have discrimination, racial, ethnic, and other forms of discrimination. So I think to really make the needed advancements in the science and in actual practice, we have to think bigger about why health disparities exist, what they are. We have to think more holistically, and then we have to study the same way. Braveheart, Jaleese, any additional thoughts on this? I just say, and then Dr. Hooper, the, the interventions have to be focused at the macro level rather than focusing on the individuals and asking them to change their behaviors, for example. So uh, a big point around that would be the presence of food deserts within Cleveland, right? So that's, that, that's a prime example of how that creating more food sources is a macro intervention. It, it is, you know, and the, I think the, the topic of uh, food, nutrition, physical activity, food insecurity is an important one. And I think I would, I would offer a friendly amendment. So I would say that the uh, community level or, or macro level interventions, policy, you know, that's where you really have the, the greatest effect. I still think though, maybe this is because I'm a psychologist and I believe in therapy and focusing on individual level behavior change. I think that we still have a role for, for those factors because people still have to live while we're working on changing policy, which may or may not be changed, depending on political will and adequate data to support potential change, that we have to help people function within the environment and the context that they live. And so, you know, I've done interventions with people who want to lose weight and maintain a healthier weight, but live in an underserved, medically underserved community where there is a food desert and it is um, challenging for them to survive in that context. So I could wait and we could wait for legislation and policy to, to change. But in the meantime, our communities are becoming less healthy. And so I see a role for those, but they have to be community responsive. They have to understand the people who live in communities. They have to understand those challenges to say, how can you live within the context of what's happening now and still promote adaptive behavior change that will improve not only your health, but the health of your family and your community? I love this lens that you're bringing. And, um, you know, it occurs to me that like just the last two years with COVID is a great example of all of these uh, different factors, confluence of factors that you've, you've talked about. Um, in 2020, um, there was a, a article that was published, um, your article about COVID-19 and racial and ethnic disparities. And the article stated that the possibility that genetic or other biological factors may predispose individuals to more severe fatality related to COVID-19 um, and that was an empirical question that needed to be addressed. Um, what insights have you or the scientific community gained since that um, article about trends we're seeing in racially and ethnically underserved communities and COVID-19 outcomes? 
Um, well, thank you for bringing up that, that article. You know, I have to say that article was published in May 2020. It was written in, in April 2020, so right at the start of the pandemic. And it is by far my most cited article ever written. Um, and it was uh, focused on, it was a commentary in the Journal of the America, American Medical Association focused on COVID-19 and racial ethnic disparities. So it was at the beginning of when these disparities by race ethnicity were beginning to emerge. And that statement about the possibility, because it's always in a scientific space, it is an empirical question about whether or not a phenomenon is, is accurate and what the mechanisms that might underlie that phenomenon are. And so there is the possibility, and I think especially because when we first started to hear about COVID-19 disparities by race and ethnicity, we heard mostly about medical comorbidities being the primary answer. Well, that's because maybe these populations, and really it was um, most racial ethnic minority groups that were having these disparities immediately. We saw them among African-American or Black individuals, among Latino or Hispanic individuals, where data were available among American Indian, Alaska Native individuals, and then where data were available with much smaller, much smaller data availability among Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islander groups. And so when you have this number of groups all experiencing greater rates in terms of cases and transmission from COVID-19, uh, from hospitalization and um, in death, you know, for me, when I was hearing medical comorbidities is the answer and the potential that there's maybe some biological genetic explanation, I said, well, you know, that is an empirical question, but I know from my own experience and from my research that that explanation is problematic because it is absent the full context of the pandemic. We know that race is a socio-cultural political construct. It is not a biological or genetic construct. And it's, 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 it is important that we study race because it does shape the lived experiences of all groups and individuals. But we have to zoom out and look at the full context, which includes those structural or systemic factors that we've been talking about, such as the ongoing and and um, historical discrimination and also things that were, that Braveheart mentioned like chronic stress and its effect on you know, immunologic functioning. And it's true when we talk about medical comorbidities that racial and ethnic minority groups as we talked about are facing an undue burden from a litany of medical comorbidities. And many medical comorbidities such as obesity is um, they are associated with worse outcomes from COVID, but why? is the question we have to ask ourselves. Yeah. Why is it that these populations may have a greater risk of, more, of, of, obese, of obesity, greater cancer, other, other things? And it's, it's not because of genetics or biology. It is because you have structural issues that are taking place that lead and drive differences in exposure, drive differences in risk, drive differences for access to high quality healthcare. Um, and that's what's going on with COVID rather than inherent biology or genetic or genetic concerns. So we did indicate that as a possibility in the article. Since then, we've not seen, I've not come across any evidence to suggest that these racial and ethnic populations who are facing this undue burden from COVID it has any reflection on genetics. Although I have seen folks uh, write about that and, and try to make that connection. Jalice or Braveheart, is there anything that you would like to add or emphasize? Building off of when we think about socioeconomic status and the digital divide, especially in Cleveland, you know, there were some blanket or some initiatives that were implemented like telehealth to ensure that clinical research studies could continue when individuals weren't able to come into the hospitals and ambulatory facilities. And if we already know that we have these health disparities and really just disparities in resources abroad, understanding that so much work needs to be done even when something like telehealth looks like it would be so great and such a quick fix if you will so as we implement things like technology to attempt to increase access just understanding that there's a ton of work to do and if we're intentional and inclusive we can make progress but if we're not we will see the kind of impact that we see now which is not that great mm -hmm. Thanks. I'll underscore that, um, Braveheart, one moment. I'll underscore that about the, the digital inequities because in, in my own research career, I, I found that people were not convinced, and this was a few years ago, that, that the digital divide was still an issue, right? Everybody has a cell phone, everybody is online, 
And I always made the argument that that's not accurate. And, and certainly for the years I lived in Cleveland, um, it, it was stark in terms of um, in terms of the lack of access to um, to Wi-Fi or broadband at home. People are using their mobile phones. And I conducted a study in the area of tobacco cessation. It was a, a mobile health study in the city of Cleveland. And what I found was that even it was a text messaging program. So sending text messages to people with videos and advice on how to quit smoking. And the number of people who were ineligible to, to participate in the study because they did not have stable internet access, they were on smaller carriers, pay-as-you-go phones. Um, and, and then even for those who, who were eligible, we still found significant uh, challenges with, with more than we expected, I think, participants who did not know how to use their phone in the ways that we wanted, which were, were relatively simple by, I think, the general standard. And it was a really stark example of how you really, uh, when it comes to technology, it might be shiny and new, and we think it's innovative, but it's likely to leave certain populations and groups behind. Yeah, right. And, th and then just speaking of COVID, right, and talking about higher rates of transmission within various communities, there are also various social factors or cultural factors, socioeconomic factors to consider. For example, who were the essential workers? Right. Who 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 are the folks who actually had to be who could not isolate and just um, work from home all the time, who actually had to go in the field and do the work. Right. And then considering who has the privilege of being able to live alone and who is culturally. Is it OK for some folks to live alone? Is it not OK for some folks to culturally isolate? And those are other factors we have to think about as well. Thank you, Braveheart. And taking those insights just a step further, what have you or the scientific community learned about the compound effect of chronic illness, racism, and the LGBT community? Huh. <laughs> where to start? Where to start? I guess I would say this is where we talk about structural intersectionality, right? So who experiences the worst of the worst effects? Uh, just stark, stark, stark data in this year for trans women of color and where is their health condition as compared to, you know, comparing it to the other rest of the population. Looking at the health conditions of the trans population as compared to the rest of the LGB population, right, even there. So we are seeing even within the queer community, how is racism, misogyny, queer phobia, all those things, how, how is it trickling down? to specific minority populations. Dr. Rob Hooper, is there anything you'd like to add? I, I will add that um, another thing that we have observed as it relates to the LGBT community and this experience uh, around COVID is the, the lack of access has been stark. The social isolation has also been highly problematic. When you have, um, and I'm sure many of your clients who come to the center, if the center is closed or not available and um, services are only available limited um, in more limited you know, frequencies and potentially online, that that social isolation from communities that offer support has really been problematic in terms of uh, coping and being able to manage the anxiety and the mental health challenges that COVID has brought about. It has been particularly detrimental for things like the spread of misinformation or the COVID-19 infodemic with lots of really uh, deliberately inaccurate messages being uh, disseminated and people not having access to trusted sources of information. And, and then we've also seen an increase in uh, behavioral health concerns in LGBT community as well as racial and ethnic minority communities. And I think the, the intersectionality of that is uh, there are also data emerging that there are particular elevations in, um, in opioid use, in alcohol use, and in tobacco product use, all things that are, are major concerns and even some areas that we were making strides in, such as tobacco use. There are concerns about um, the uh, relapse rates particularly being high and um, the initiation, partly to manage the anxiety, the stress and the depression around social isolation and the pandemic. Yeah, I, I 
want to um, piggyback off of what you just said in terms, and one of our um, audience members also uh, put in a comment about legislation and the sociopolitical environment, right? So in Ohio, we have HB 616 that has been introduced in the legislature, which is um, really targeting or using the LGBTQ community as a dog whistle to really um, make it okay to be racist or not talk about racism or not talk about our uh, American history and slavery um, and uh, identity and sexuality and all, you know, all of the things that are really core to minority community identity, right? Um, and I also think about the compounded impact of seeing these types of legislation being introduced across the country. And you're hearing that in the news, you're hearing that in social conversation and on social media. And what kind of impact is that having uh, on top of all of the um, things that you just talked about around mental health, around physical health and access and opioid use and things like that. Um, I recently saw an article that said, why are America's youth um, struggling with mental health? Like, and I'm like, well, really, if you look at the kinds of legislation that are being passed that are targeting LGBTQ kids, um, that's one explanation for it, right? Like when, when it, it, communities are made to feel so othered and so dehumanized. Um, and then you expand that out just looking at the historical lived experience of uh, the queer community um, as an example. Um, there's also a lot of generational trauma and generational um, compounded impact that also is creating these or contributing to these health disparities. Um, you know, given everything that all of you have shared. I'm I'm wondering, like, you know, research continues, and and one of the things that I firmly believe is that research can be an avenue for intervention and mitigating um, minority-related health disparities. And I'm just uh, wondering from you, what are some ways um, that researchers who want to support or lead research in our communities, how can they do so both effectively? and respectfully. Um, Braveheart, I'm particularly interested in hearing uh, your experience because you are not just a researcher, you are also a community member and you've also been a participant, right? So you have both that really unique view of being on both sides of, of that line. And um, what, are your, what are your thoughts? First thought is it's, it's a great privilege and honor to be on both sides of the conversation, right? Like, the honor of a lifetime. And uh, yeah, the, I do believe there are, like I've had good experiences as a participant and then some several bad experiences. And hopefully I'm integrating the bad experiences so that I do not repeat them and create a counter space. And one of the big points that comes up for me is this idea of doing research on the community rather than with the community, right? So this idea, if someone's gonna come in the community with like the savior notion, I'm gonna save you, that does not seem to work. And it tends to you know, turn people off, including me. And so research needs not to be transactional, but rather relational. And long-term research definitely, hopefully can do that with the community. So actually answering the questions that we as the community have and for the community rather than curiosities of research itself, right? Like, like what, what are the really important questions to answer for the community? And another focus on that is for, for too long, we've been doing damage-centered research. So why are there increased health disparities within minority communities or queer communities? And can we flip the switch to more strength-based focus? So what, what, what are the resilience factors within the trans community? that has enabled us to survive in such a hostile environment, for example. So what are those factors to consider? I'll stop there. That's a really good point. Dr. Webb Hooper, any additional thoughts? I'll add a thought that I think from a you know, research methodology perspective that you know, we refer to this type of research, what you're talking about research, within communities, particularly those who have been minoritized. 
and are um, in many, many ways disadvantaged, that it's important that we apply the principles of community engaged research. And community engaged research, you know, exists on a spectrum from just something that is very uh, peripheral and there's some community engagement, are you recruiting people to participate who are within a community, but they're not actually integrally involved in the work. They didn't have input into the questions that were being asked to begin with. And so that's part of the, the coming in as a researcher, particularly when you are not a direct member of a community, but even if you are approaching it from a place of cultural humility really goes a long way to demonstrate that that you don't think you know everything, you don't think that you know all the issues, that you're open to hearing that, that you're flexible with your initial ideas, which, which may be well-intended and important scientifically and from a health perspective, but that you, you plan to approach it from a place of true partnership and collaboration with, with the communities that you're serving and that you're looking for ways to give back, to be present, um, and to demonstrate genuine interest and sincerity. And when people can feel that from you, it's an energy, it's a vibe, if you will, that they could feel, then it really does make a difference um, in, in the reception, in the experience. But I think that it is important for um, to have better science, just do better science when you're approaching it from a more informed perspective versus the, the savior complex or just coming in with an, an academic awareness of issues. But that's kind of where your, your, your knowledge base um, stops. And if I could add one more piece to that with uh, community outreach and engagement, when I think about my time in economic and community development, just the idea that there are so many gems and the lived experience is invaluable. And the fact that a lot of times we invite community organizations and members to the table, and there's this expectation that they should be grateful, but we need something from them. So valuing time with compensation, and understanding that the insight they're giving us, we can't buy. We, we really can't. So that appreciation, respect, trust building, these are things that we hear a lot about, but just think about how you treat your friend or a family member and how that relationship started in the beginning and what are some of the, I don't wanna say strategies and tactics necessarily, but how did you treat another human being who you wanted to have a relationship with long-term? And that's how we need to approach these community organizations and community members so that we can come to the block club meetings and really be an integral part of the fabric of what they do and the impact that they have on the communities. And when it's time to disseminate research and time to invite them to join our community advisory boards and the institutional review board, they were like, well, I was waiting for that invitation. I'm glad that it's finally being extended instead of like, well, why do you want me to do this? Mm -hmm. So then for our next question on the flip side, Dr. Webb Hooper, why should marginalized communities and individuals be part of research projects? I think, um, well, I think there's a number of reasons. First of all, why not? Um, we, we should be included, right? We, we never want to be excluded from anything. We should be included. We want, I think, science and, and research to reflect the demographics of the United States, the real demographics of the United States. And for far too long, many groups have not had an opportunity to be included. Um, if you participate in, in research and in intervention research in particular, that's where you have access to cutting edge treatment. So if you are a member of, if you are a patient, if you will, or a participant in a clinical trial, a randomized clinical trial, RCT, it's kind of our, our still our gold standard for testing the, you know, the efficacy of a new treatment and ultimately disseminating them into practice or to community settings. And it's important for generalizability, but I think beyond that, it is access to, um, you know, highest quality evidence-based evidence care, Participants and patients who are in clinical trials are tracked over time. So when I've worked in, in, in oncology settings with cancer patients, you know, people have said, well, I don't want to be, you know, someone's guinea pig in a you know, new chemotherapy study, for instance. Well, the, the way the studies are currently conducted is no one is getting a placebo chemotherapy. Everyone's either getting the standard of care chemotherapy or a new um, cutting edge treatment. So those patients are, are benefiting by being able to be tracked and monitored and often receiving free therapy. And that is an important benefit that I think many participants may not be aware of. I don't think it's really being explained well. I think that the scientific community, the medical community haven't really done the best job of easing the minds of groups who have faced atrocities in the name of science. And I think we need to do better 
yeah. in that space. I'll give you one other example of why I think it's important just from a from an ultimate uptake perspective, and that's the COVID-19 experience, which is highlighted so much, even though many of us already knew it, but it's highlighted a lot for people who hadn't thought about these topics, right? And it brought to the, I, I had not seen so many articles in the general media about the issue of lack of inclusion in of racial ethnic minority populations in clinical trials. Very longstanding problem. I mean, there's a law that was passed in 1993, which is called the NIH Revitalization Act of 1993, which was the act that said that grant proposals and grants and projects are required to include racial ethnic minority individuals as participants. And they have to, um, you know, they have to indicate their planned enrollment by race, ethnicity, by sex or gender, and now um, by age. And so that we have sort of a lifespan perspective. So there's a law that says we have to do this. But I think that it's important not only from the, as I mentioned, generalizability, oh, do these findings generalize by groups? I think it's also important for the uptake. And what we saw with COVID was that when the vaccine trials were about to start, and many of you may remember when you're seeing studies, stories about this on the news, the trials were going to start in January of 2020. The first trial to kick off was the Moderna code study. And um, well, actually, I shouldn't say that. Pfizer actually started just before Moderna, but they were not a part of the op what was then called Operation Warp Speed, which NIH was you know, not funding, but helping to support. And so that one of the major concerns that our then director of NIH, Dr. Francis Collins, noted was with the, with the knowledge that clinical trials often um, are, um, un, racial ethnic minority groups are often underrepresented in clinical trials, but then also seeing the disparities that had emerged, he expressed a concern that we would end up with, um, with primarily white, individuals participating in the vaccine trials. And what would happen down the line with that if that were the case, when this is getting all this media attention and if people say, were, was anyone like me included in the study? And, and if so, were there any challenges? Were there any issues? And so that was something that we sought to address right away. Um, and we worked with Moderna very closely, myself included, to help them think about strategies for better community outreach and engagement. And uh, I think that they took it seriously. And if you look at the, the outcomes and the demographics for their trial by race, ethnicity, you'll see that they, um, they, they were respectable. They, they were not, I think, reflective of the actual burden of, of COVID-19 disease, but they're much better than the average industry funded or industry supported clinical trials. And that's because they had to make specific outreach efforts and you have to kind of, that's what equity is about, right? Going out of your way to do more so that you can make sure that people are included and have the best opportunity for success. That's what equity is about. And once they started to apply that lens to the work, there was an increase in the enrollment of racial and ethnic minority populations. And that is an example of what needs to happen just going forward. So it's the pandemic has just been you know, so devastating to all of us. I think there have been a few silver linings of things just that have been brought to the forefront and that hopefully we are serious about addressing not only for this issue, but changing the systems of how we do business, the business of science going forward. Absolutely. Now, this question is for the entire group. As someone who has been engaged in this work of creating access and visibility to increase participation of historically underserved populations in research, I'm wondering what is a key piece of information that you'd want underserved, marginalized communities to understand about research and why it's important for representation in research? So if you had an opportunity to say one thing. Um, I, I would say representation matters. Like that would be my one liner. Um, it's not very profound, but I, I truly do believe that, you know, to your point, Dr. Webb Hooper about um, equity and also about being able to, you know, when I know that people like me are, in, are involved in the, in the clinical trials and in the research, I'm, going, I'm more likely to trust the outcomes or what the findings are of that research, because I can relate to it. And that's where I feel that represent visibility of representation really it can be very important um, in terms of adoption of the intervention that's being tested 
or the interventions that are developed based on the findings and the recommendations of, of a research study. But I'm, you know, you guys are the experts. That's just my two cents, my very non-clinical two cents. <laughs> Go ahead, Bravar. Well, I, I just say uh, a principle within system science, we often talk about the idea of we can't be part of the solution without joining the messy problem. And so that, that's how I see science, right? Like I would encourage folks to join simply because there are folks who are trying to solve this messy, wicked problem. And there are no promises of it being perfect ever. But... In my anecdotal experience, there are many of folks who are really trying to make, to improve the system and to see that it serves those who need serve, serving, you know? I have two. Can I get, can I say two things instead of, of one? We'll give you two. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. There's two. I'm thinking because there's, there's so many things. I think one is that the, um, it's important for representation of of those groups who have been underrepresented because these are the same groups who have not benefited equitably from the medical and scientific advances that are there. And, and part of that is, is because of the, the lack of inclusion. So that is a reason I think it's really important to be involved so that we can benefit equitably. And then, you know, I guess the second thing is just from my experience in working for years and recruiting over the years, thousands of under groups that are typically underrepresented in research studies, medically underserved groups, racial and ethnic minority individuals, um, is that the experience can be a really positive one. And it can lead to important changes in one's life that might be unexpected. And I can think of, of you know, the first day of a group therapy intervention and me asking people, why'd you decide to come today? I'm sure you debated in your head about whether or not you really were gonna show up to participate in this study. And so often, so often what I heard people say was, yeah, I did almost not come. And I was concerned about what this is, but after they heard about it and after they, they listened to our explanation and experienced it for the first time, the number of people said, you know, I'm really glad I came. And um, I've conducted a lot of tobacco cessation trials and helping people and it's sort of a four week intervention of intensive therapy to help them you know, make the most important, single most important health behavior change they can make. And seeing people on day one to the end of the intervention after they've been successful, they were almost like totally different people because of the experience. And it's been, it's, it's just, it's, it's positive um, in many cases. And I think because of the, you know, the really atrocious things that have happened has created a, a, a reasonable fear and a reasonable skepticism that is there. But as Braveheart mentioned, there are people really trying to do this well and right, and we want to be a part of that. All right. Now, Dr. Webb Hooper, since we gave you two, the last question, the last formal question will go to you. Last week, you were featured in a Bloomberg Law article that proclaimed the time is now to end racial inequities in research, highlighting recent success of the UNITE initiative. Can you tell us about the UNITE initiative and how we can get involved or support its aims? Sure. So I'm glad you asked about UNITE. UNITE is um, one of the legacies of our former director, Dr. Collins. And I, I call it 2020, like the collision of 2020 happened. So we witnessed in front of us, essentially the murder of, of George Floyd and, and that co colliding with the pandemic and the murder of other um, of other individuals um, in really just awful ways. And so the collision of the events of 2020 led to the, the creation of what NIH calls the UNITE initiative. And UNITE is an acronym. Each letter stands for one of the five interrelated committees of UNITE. Um, and the goal of UNITE is to, it, the aspirational and very ambitious goal of ending structural racism in the biomedical research enterprise. So that's at all levels of the biomedical research enterprise, starting with NIH looking within at our own um, perpetuation of, of racism. And Dr. Collins wrote, as many groups and organizations did, you know, a statement apologizing and acknowledging the role that NIH has played in the perpetuation of, of medical and scientific racism, which was very profound and um, meaningful in many ways. And UNITE stems from you know, his desire to make sure that we could do something active to try to use the, the influence of 
you know, the largest biomedical research agency in the world to address this problem. And so UNITE is that effort. We launched it officially almost just over one year ago in March, 2021. And um, the committees are working actively on what NIH can do. And that might include new opportunities for health disparities and, and research, uh, health disparities research or research to advance health equity. And there've been a number of new funding opportunities. Um, I co-chair a, a committee that the U and UNITE is the understanding community stakeholder experiences. And so we've been conducting listening sessions across um, you know, different segments of the biomedical research enterprise. Actually three of those were, were analyzing those summaries and posting them on the website. Three have been posted. I've got three more to review tonight actually. We wanna to return to the participants. What did we hear um, when they came and shared with us? And then of course we wanna to try to look at what is actionable, what's feasible and actionable from what we heard to try to integrate that within our funding opportunities with looking at any policies that might be able to be changed. So it's a, it's a really important effort. I, we think of it as a marathon though. And that's one of the points in that, in that article is that this is not, I mean, you're not gonna, if you can solve racism, it would have been solved, but we can make strides and we can continue to stay persistent. And that's what has to happen for even incremental change. And in this time I've seen, I've seen some changes starting. Even the fact that we're still talking about it almost you know, about two years later is a big deal. Many people would not have thought that you know, they thought this was just a blip, a wave, well, everyone's gonna forget about this, but we're still talking about it. And I've seen the momentum being maintained in a way that I just haven't previously. So I've maintained my cautious optimism that, um, that we can make um, important, but maybe incremental changes over a period of time. Amen to that. I was one of those people that did it, that thought that we would not be having this conversation still two years later. I totally thought it's gonna, um, it's gonna be a wave that just passes over us and we're gonna be back to business as usual. And I am I am very um, grateful that this conversation continues because just because of of the the impact and and the ripple effects of of these disparities and these structural um, barriers and and racism and institutionalized oppressive practices, right? Um, I think like, so that is, it wraps up our formal session. I would like to open it up to our participants for um, a Q and A. Uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat or you, you know, feel free to unmute yourself um, to ask any questions or, or if you have any comments that you would like to share. Any takers? Got a shy audience. Can I pose a question to the audience? <laughs> yes. What inspired you to join us this evening? How did we get this hour of your time? That's a great question. Well, that's an easy one for me because I've been working in this area for the last 12 years. Um, but also because, you know, there's rock stars on this panel, so. <laughs> And I'm, I'm just always looking for better, more inclusive ways to do my work, you know, to reach out to different communities, to involve different communities, to make sure that uh, uh, people are being valued in their time volu volunteering with us, and that they understand how, um, how important it is that, uh, you know, that, that they're showing up and that we appreciate them. So just always trying to look for different angles to do that. Thanks, Brooke. Bar Barbie, would, do you have a comment? Um, it's Tamara actually uh, oh. here as well, sorry. Um, yeah, I, I kind of wanted to share that one of the reasons that I joined the panel and, and found it very interesting was um, just in the process myself of, of going back um, for my PhD um, in nursing. And my primary area of focus and interest is LGBTQ health. So I um, wanted to hear what the experts were saying and um, just learn more from you. Thank you. Anybody else who would like to share? 
Um, I see a comment in the chat from Carly that says that um, they're interested in entering this research space. So I hope that you found this to be in informational and um, helpful. Um, again, like if there are questions, comments, I really would love for this to be a conversation um, for, for all of us to engage in if there, if there are any thoughts that you would like to share. Sure, I can share. Um, can yeah. you see and hear me? Yes. Okay, hi, it's nice to meet you all. Um, I'm a medical student, a first year medical student at Case Western uh, with Carly actually, and we are both getting involved in LGBTQ centered research and uh, clinical practice interest. And so I think we're both here looking for any advice that could either be specific to medical students or just specific to um, the process of getting started with clinical research and how we can do that in the most respectful way and in a way that benefits the community that we're trying to benefit, which is the LGBTQ community, but specifically um, the trans community. Pray for it. Doctor. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I can just say this one thing, Kelly. Um, when, one of my mentors talks about this idea of moving forward at the speed of trust. And I found that to be really valuable within the community. We often come in with like solid timelines, you know? I need to get my data collection done in six months because that's when my funding ends, or right? Like whatever parameters we come up in with. And you know, those are real constraints. They are real constraints. And yet the idea, does, does the community trust that after I've come in and gotten their stories and their narratives and pain, do they trust that I'll also come back next week and the week after and maintain some sort of relationship? And when they need something, they can like reach out. I, there is such, I have found such profound value in long-term relationships over there and bridge building that that's been helpful for me. Thanks. Any other questions, thoughts um, to our panelists or the audience? Actually, I have another question. So I obviously just gave the intro that I'm I'm getting involved in um, research that's focused on trans healthcare and a lot of what we focus on is gender affirming surgery, but really like any aspect of trans healthcare is relevant under the scope of our group. And I was I heard what you said earlier about focusing on what the community has questions about versus the questions that we think are interesting or important and like and instead centering the community and focusing on what their their perceptions of their health needs are. How practically speaking, do you have any recommendations for how we can do that? I think it's kind of uh, I'll jump in over here because yeah, that's okay. I think it's really conversations. It's I've been part of a couple of studies recently, Kelly, in which we came in with what we thought was the research question around gender affirming care. And when we engaged in conversations, we found that is not what was bothering folks at all. Like that, and um, yeah, I think it's conversations. It's conversations on one-on-one -on -one spaces, but also community spaces. And very often what I've experienced is like within the community, there is a consensus of what is the most priority issue in dealing with that. I'd like to add a couple of thoughts um, as someone who, um, so I have the privilege at the center has the privilege really of serving in some ways in that gatekeeping role with the community um, where, uh, you know, universities, researchers, medical students, folks reach out to us and want what they want to engage in research with the community. And, um, you know, over the last few years, we have learned so much from partners like Dr. Webb Hooper, like Braveheart um, and uh, others that have really helped us develop our own sort of best practices of what we are looking for 
um, when we are partnering? Like, like, like how, how do we make those choices of who we choose to partner with and, and not? And um, wanna, I wanna go back to one of the things that Dr. Webb Hooper mentioned um, in response to one of the questions about involving the community right from the get-go, right from the get-go around how folks are being approached, the design of this, this research study, the, the questions that are going to be posed or asked, the methods of recruitment, the communication, um, and those for us have sort of become a gold standard by which we judge who, who should we partner to, who is safe to partner with and who isn't. Because often what has happened is that we have, um, the way that research happens in, in minority communities is very exploitative um, and extractive. Like folks are coming in to get the information and then you don't ever hear from them again. And so, we found ourselves more and more as a center initially always asking, well, what is your plan for bringing, distributing and disseminating this information? And that has slowly evolved as we have learned more um, as lay people about research and how to engage in this in a way that is respectful and safe, but also beneficial to the community that our emphasis has gone not just only from being focused on dissemination, but what are your plans to stick around and help us now interpret these findings and these results to develop interventions or programming that is going to be beneficial to our community? How can we use this information beyond just an infographic or you know, talking at people? And that is, I think that if you come in with that mindset and that approach already around, I want to truly partner with, I think that you will have a lot more success, and I think that um, you it'll be easier to build build a trust based relationship that's based on mutual respect and and integrity. That's really helpful. Thank you. Sure. I'd like to add just one thing. I mean, I, I think everything that has been stated is is spot on. The one other thing I would add that's a little bit different is that I think as a researcher, so I, I see the in the chat, the, the mention um, from Brooke on uh, CBPR, which is, which is great. Um, and it, it's a fantastic approach to bring the research, the community identified needs to a research context. I do think also as a researcher, you may have ideas that are scientifically valid because you do have a knowledge sometimes about the prevalence of of um, conditions and the severity of disease that perhaps the community members may not all know, but are very interested in knowing. So we don't wanna underestimate that uh, because a community group may not know the details of every condition that you, because it's what you study, it's what you do. And they're interested in understanding it and, and bringing it to the community in a way to say, here are the ideas we have and why this is important. I have found that even if it wasn't the primary thought going on within the community, that when it is brought to their attention in ways that are that resonate, then and also, like I said, you are coming in with a genuine perspective, and it's not a sort of either or; it's both and that you're willing to work on the project that they are interested yeah. in, and you also have a contribution. There might be creative ways. That's where you get the best science: creative ways to meld the ideas so that. You can advance the work that you know is important scientifically, but do so in a way that is community responsive and that also helps them advance the things that they also know are important. So I feel like, you know, coming into this as a new investigator, thinking always about how you can do both and how you can help accomplish those goals. And, and also being flexible with your initial question that it may be revi revised and probably refined and it's better science because you've taken that approach. 100% yes to everything that you just said. Are there any other comments, questions? Brooke, do you have anything you'd like to ask or share? We're just going back to the idea of um, creating partnerships and collaborations. One of the things I'm trying to do is always be cognizant of, of reaching out to 
communities that I'm not familiar with uh, and that I will find it necessary, you know, feel that it's necessary to support. One example I'm thinking of is a very small grassroots organization locally, um, Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition. They do a lot of really great work in a lot of different areas. Um, and I just try to help as, as, as often as possible to volunteer with them, to connect with them, to support them, to you know, keep promoting what they're promoting on social media and, and really lifting up their work. Um, it won't necessarily have any direct um, benefit for my organization, but it might down the road, who knows? And I just think it's really important to especially lift up you know, smaller minority organizations doing good work like that. Thanks, Brock. Well, if there isn't anything additional, I just want to extend my deep, sincere gratitude to my dear friends and colleagues and um, folks that I look up to and that are my mentors, uh, Braveheart, Julie's, Dr. Webb Hooper, for your time and your willingness to in engage in this conversation. I know that time is one of our most precious commodities. And I am so grateful that you were willing to spend some of that commodity with us. Um, and I really appreciate your support and your advocacy and your allyship with the community um, and in helping to really advance this conversation and keep it relevant and keep it on our radars. So I genuinely appreciate your time and your knowledge. Mm -hmm. And also to our participants, um, thank you so much for spending an hour and eight minutes of your time with us. I really appreciate that you took time out of your busy day to be with us. Um, we This recording will be posted on our YouTube channel, so you can always access it later and we'll be sending out, it out via our social media as well. With that, I'd like to bid you good night and thanks once again. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.